thought, thought Mark's presentation, you know, is, is exactly what I'm trying to present, uh, but more local. Uh, so, so what is uh, Fab Lab? Um, well, we're an organization uh, in Adelaide, and uh, we're a space, really, uh, and in that space is some tools. Uh, in particular, there is 3D printers uh, and a laser cutter. There's a number of hand tools um, and, and other digital fabrication tools. So what happens in this space? Well, around the tools, sort of like uh, books in a library, people gather because they want the books, but then there's so much more that, that comes from that. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, one of the things we do is we'll just sort of etch things, and we, we start pretty simple, like etching a wine glass, you know, tell me when to stop. Uh, but we are also running um, workshops, you know, uh, ha introduction to programming the Arduino, because people who can make things want to, to program things, but often lack the skills. So there's a lot of peer learning that happens. Um, we, in these workshops, you know, the, 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 one of my first uh, slides sort of showed a very, uh, you know, picturesque kind of scene, uh, but this, this photo on the right, you know, I think really symbolizes the, you know, crowded, crazy nature of it all. There's cables everywhere and, and you've got, you know, Wi-Fi routers and people reinstalling the computer at, you know, 9 a.m. in the morning for some reason. Uh, it, it's, it's really like a, a crazy, uh, organic community. Uh, so we also uh, go on the road sometimes. We go out to um, you know, other places, um, both in Adelaide and, and outside, and explain 3D printing or digital fabrication to people. So here I am, uh, and you can just see the mother in the background you know, peering over the kids' shoulders as, as I'm trying to explain the, the concept. Um, we also do things in-house, so, so people might come to Fab Lab, uh, you know, as a, a place to learn, say, soldering or, or you know, about 3D printing. Uh, so we, we both do internal and external. Uh, but more than anything, we're a community. Uh, this is a, a Christmas decoration by a friend of mine, and I think it really just symbolizes what we're about. You know, you need some Christmas decorations. Well, buy $2 of, of, of plywood and just start cutting your own. And make it personalized, which is the real advantage of this technology, that you can make a physical object with a personal message, sometimes very literally. Uh, the other thing we do is 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 test the uh, test the tools and and so we we might try like you know, laser etching the sausages. So like any other organization, we have our sausage sizzles. But you know we like to to think we're a cutting edge sausage sizzle uh, dispenser. So. Uh, what do people do at Fab Lab? You know, I showed you a couple of examples, but uh, I'm going to sort of do this, this sort of circular case study uh, uh, that I like to call rookie casting. Uh, this is a project that, that I started uh, when I first started at Fab Lab. I decided, oh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Fab Labber, I, I'm a maker. I, I suppose I better start making something. I've never really done that before. So I, I started by just drawing really simple outlines uh, and then using the laser cutter to, to you know, cut those out and then I would just glue them together. It was a really, really crude uh, system, but, but I kind of like this. I, you know, I started with the idea of a chess set. So um, you know, my prototypes evolved and then I moved into laser cut MDF and then I moved into laser cut acrylic. Then I moved into 3D printing and then I started like attaching sprues uh, and then I moved into uh, you know, a smaller size and uh, I got into bronze casting eventually. But there was like this um, you know, evolutionary style where I would just develop uh, really quickly. Um, you know, here's an example of, of the chess rooks I was doing. I would pump out a new chess rook about every 30 minutes on a good day uh, and, and have one printing the previous version while I was working on the next one. Uh, and this is how I, I began to, to learn about casting. I would just print all the time and the, you know, it was like a printing press and it was sort of like a challenge to, to, to keep up uh, with, with the, the printer, you know, it's going to take 30 minutes. Can I come up with a new innovation in 30 minutes so that when it finishes, I'll have something else to put on? Uh, this is also how I learned about 3D printing. Uh, you know, I started not knowing anything, and uh, you know, you can see the shot on the left with this horrible, horrible 3D print. Uh, and then, you know, as, as you learn more about it, you know, just by, by printing and, and learning by doing, uh, was, was the way I learned, uh, and I kind of wish that, uh, you know, in hindsight, I had uh, combined this with learning by research. Uh, that would have been 
a, a far more effective way. But but I think that uh, you know I'll elaborate on this later. But you know learning is, is a good thing to combine with making, and and in fact making is learning, uh, and we need to in institutions of learning. Uh, have making uh, because some people don't learn by reading books some people learn by by watching by doing and some people learn by a bit of both and I think that for me I only really got interested in reading books after I had had done a bit of making uh, and and so uh, I, I think that you know we would reach out to more people uh, and, and get more people in libraries uh, if there was a a diverse range of things you could do in the library, and there is so many things, but one thing that's currently, um, I think, lacking is making. So um, this is how the project ended up. I, I started, you know, bronze casting, uh, you know, and this sort of, I, I guess, uh, shows how it, how it progresses. So you saw all the, the previous versions, and then I decided, oh, well, you know, plastic's horrible, I don't like it. I'm going to work in bronze because that's what everything good is made of. So, uh, you know, I, I walked next door to the jewelry, jewelers and I said, hi, you know, I, I want to cast some 3D printing. I, I read about it a bit on the internet. Um, will you let me cast in your jewelry facilities, pretty please? Uh, and they said yes, uh, which was really surprising. So uh, th then, you know, th these are the same laser cut, um, you know, forms that, that you've seen previously where I was just laser cutting uh, and gluing together acrylic in this case, uh, and then just sticking it on a sprue uh, and, and, you know, casting. And, you know, I didn't have a, a directive or an assignment. I just wanted to make my chess pieces. Um, so one of my friends, this is sort of where, where Fab Lab gets involved, you know. This is sort of like my little project in the corner of Fab Lab, and you know, I, I'm being very reclusive with my obsessive chess set manufacturer. Uh, and one of my friends, David Byworth, says, hi, oh, you know, I, I've got this little key that goes in an umbrella, and uh, it, it broke. Uh, and I tried to 3D print one and, and, and make a replacement, but it too broke because it was made of plastic. Uh, will you help me cast it in, into brass? And so I said, yeah, sure. So, so then, you know, we, get, we go back to the, the jewelers at ACRT and they say, hey, you know, now you've let me in. Can, you know, you help my friend as well? Uh, and they agree, uh, <laughs> perhaps foolishly. Um, so then uh, David, who is a graphic designer, uh, makes me some business cards. So there's this real reciprocation that, that I understand casting and he understands how to, to make me look good. Uh, <laughs> but then my friend Ben comes along in Fab Lab and he said, oh, you know, I'm already making 3D printed jewelry and basically he 3D prints these things in wax using a company called iMaterialize and more recently Shapeways as well. Uh, and then they do a lost wax casting into silver. And he says, I'd love to learn how you do the casting process because I want to get involved as well. And this, this sort of project of, of chess pieces is snowballing into a variety of other projects. Um, so uh, Ben and I decide to do a little bit of a, a side collaboration. I get distracted from chess pieces for a moment. Uh, and, and he models up this pirate. And you can see his, his uh, modeling skills are much better than mine. Uh, and then, so, so we cast that as well, like going back to the jewelers, hi, can we cast pirates now? You know, and, and this is, uh, you know, the, the very much the snowball, you know, it started with a tiny chess piece. Um, so then my brother-in-law finds out, he says, oh, I'm writing a comic book, you know, and it has a bronze, you know, statue in it, in one of the frames. What would be really good is if we could, uh, if we could have, like, a bronze statue of that. Uh, and so then I, I talked to... Um, Talk to my brother-in-law, I said, oh, you need lots of, you know, detailed sketches, you know, it's going to be very hard. And he says, don't worry, I'll draw you all the drawings. And so he, he draws up uh, the drawings. And then, you know, I go back to Ben, and I say, hey, look, you know, I've done some casting for you. Do you think you can help me learn how to do digital modeling? Because I'm no good at it, as you can see. Uh, and so we start, you know, working from the, these, these sketches uh, in, into, um, you know, a crude form. And so now I'm, I'm the one learning with this new project uh, that, that is still underway, because now I've got too many projects. Uh, so then Ben starts learning more about casting, and he's already pretty good at it, but uh, I suppose now that it's been done a few times, uh, you know, just recently he, he starts 3D printing things, and he makes candles and, and resin copies, uh, and, you know, ignites a passion. Uh, 
So, so then, you know, now we're all qualified in, in, you know, going from 3D printing to molding, we decide to run a workshop because, you know, that's what you do, like, you know, you just keep, keep going at it and, you know, it's like, well, now we, we, we think we know some more, like, we'll run a workshop and see if anyone corrects us. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's, uh, the, you know, the organic nature of it. So then, you know, I, uh, I looking to, to work directly in metal, so I, I tire of, of bronze, and I find out CSIRO has a, a titanium printer. And uh, so, I, so I email CSIRO, I was like, can I come and see your titanium printer? And they foolishly say yes. And then once I'm in the door, I said, can I use your titanium printer? I've got a design all ready to go. It's gone through a hundred iterations. Please, please, let me use your million dollar titanium printer. I promise to be responsible. Um, they agree. Uh, <laughs> So now we have titanium chess pieces printed on state-of-the-art machinery in Melbourne. And this is sort of uh, another thing that's happening with FabLab. It's not just FabLab by itself, it's not just individual makers, but it's becoming an ecosystem where titanium chess pieces that started in plastic uh, are, are now you know, iterating into you know, one of only 12 titanium printers by this company uh, in the world. And CSIRO has one of them. Um, and I got to use it. I was very, very chuffed. Um, so what next? Well, you know, you can't stop at bronze, so I, I pick up uh, glass casting because, you know, well, I not make things in glass as well. I could make chess pieces after all. Uh, so then, you know, I, I get this idea, what about if I stuck my titanium chess piece into the molten glass? That might be good. Uh, so, so then the titanium burns inside the glass, and you know that was a very expensive piece of titanium I just chucked in there. So I'm glad it worked out okay. Uh, but you see this, like you know, really, you started with the the, the knights, and you know I I've, I've changed the aesthetic, and I've learned a lot, and I've just iterated mindlessly. Uh, but then also another thing happened. People started doing spin-off projects. So David, who I mentioned earlier, he's a graphic designer, and he really liked the style of stacking things together. So he starts a line of you know laser-cut felt birds, and you know uh, makes a little bit of money on the side laser-cutting these birds. Um, then, then you have, you know, kids start getting involved. They say you can make toys with them. So then they come to me, oh, can you teach me 3D printing? Uh, and I reluctantly agree. Uh, so then, you know, I, I ran this, this workshop uh, with a different organization where I would uh, teach kids to go from a concept sketch uh, into a, you know, picture of a, a 3D model of a watermelon man. Uh, because that's what the kids wanted to make, and it really ignited my passion for making it. It's just like my chess pieces, except with the watermelon man. Uh, the limitation with the technology is, is not as great as the limitation of the kids uh, and, and their willingness to sort of stick at it. And you, you'll notice the, the eye is a bit asymmetrical because the kids aren't really concerned with all the details. So it doesn't matter that there are limitations with the technology. It, the, the, how symmetrical the model is is, is a lot bigger a factor. Um, the kids as well sort of start advancing rapidly and you know, I kind of start fearing for how experienced I am because I'm like, oh my God, they're catching up. Like, they're getting pretty sophisticated with these you know, crazy dragon monsters. Uh, and they too were, were you know, going in a sort of half an hour turnaround between new toys. These toys, by the way, cost about uh, 50 cents, maybe a dollar. So uh, anyway, keep them preoccupied for you know a good half hour. Uh, so you know, depending on your finances, I think that's a pretty reasonable you know price to entertain children. Um, so, so then we 3D print them out and they, they would paint them very literally by hand. Uh, this particular model um, was made by a six-year-old uh, and it's an owl, uh, in case you can't tell. <laughs> so this is sort of the, the making spirit and, and just like my chess pieces, these kids are now learning in the same way. So uh, another project, this is Ben, by the way, he gets into scanning because he thinks, oh, you know, I could 3D print myself. Uh, so he starts working with an Xbox 360 Kinect scanner and just sort of spinning around on an office chair. But of course he needs somebody to help with that. So, you know, Fab Lab sort of becomes, gets, gets involved in that. You, you'll notice the Fab Lab t-shirt and the, the really tacky software, you know, uh, that, that gets used here because we're all doing this on a budget of zero dollars. Uh, so, this is the kind of thing, and I don't know how that project ends up, because there are so many spin-out projects. Um, 
another project where you know people start seeing uh, what you can do on the laser cutter because you know somebody made a stamp somewhere and left it around and so then all the other people from the arts college they, they, they hear about this place called Fab Lab and and now that um, you know I've sort of been out into the jewelry department uh, they sort of think oh well if he can come here maybe we can go there and so you know it sort of it starts coming back uh, you know like a boomerang you know you, you sort of make something and you put it out there and then other people start saying oh you know someone can make a stamp what about a, a complex kind of screen print with lots of colors and you know come into the fab lab we'll, we'll see what we can do so yeah they, they do that and they, they make these these beautiful pieces of art and so Fab Lab as a community is, is rapidly growing just by the act of, of making. So what is it that people at Fab Lab do is, is we just make and, and mindlessly, and, and a lot of time we don't finish any or even some of those projects, but uh, we, we just make, you know, it's this relentless idea that if I just keep making, maybe one day I'll make something good. <laughs> so, why do makerspaces belong in, in libraries? Well, I, I firmly believe that to make you need two things, uh, tools and knowledge, and knowledge is arguably a tool. Uh, and digital fabrication is becoming very popular as a tool. Uh, you know, the image in the, in the bottom left uh, shows that, you know, as, as Mark mentioned earlier, since around 2008, things have really started taking off. There's now about 65,000 3D printers sold every year up from 66 at the beginning of this graph. graph. So, uh, and there's you know, probably about 100,000 rep wraps in the world, which are a type of self-built 3D, self 3D printer. So digital fabrication has really skyrocketed in the last few years, and that's why, why people need to know. Uh, the, the image in the bottom right also shows uh, direct part uh, production over the next uh, 15 years, uh, resulting from a survey done by Waller's associates, how many people, um, you know, how many companies think that they're going to be using 3D printing as, as a way to make end use parts by 2025. And you can see that, you know, it skyrockets to nearly 50% of the companies making these 3D printers think that that's the way they're going to be making their money in 2025. It's, it's not going to be prototypes, it's going to be titanium chess pieces. So uh, Making is Learning uh, is, is a project I mentioned earlier. There's a project I take particular inspiration from. Uh, it's a clock project, and I'll, I'll show you a video of it. I'd like to show you a clock that I've printed with my 3D printer. Nearly everything is printed with a 3D printer except of a few metal parts. Here you can see the escapement mechanism printed in red and the yellow spring. The fast moving black gear is the gear for the seconds and behind that gear a little larger is the gear for the minutes and next to it the gear for the hours. I was using Blender to do the design in 3D. I was creating all the parts and it was quite tricky to size them properly so that they fit well together after printing. Here is an example. You can see the gear for the poly. is a mesh that consists of many, many, many vertices. The mesh was exported to a 3D printing software, which creates layers by layers, lines by lines. And finally, here in this 3D view, you can see all the lines together. The lines are then transferred to the 3D printer which prints very thin layers of approximately a tenth of a millimeter on top of each other. The PLA is heated up to approximately 200 degrees Celsius and the layers stick together. The, pr 
process takes pretty long to print the gear takes approximately two or three hours and here you can see the printing bed moving slowly downwards and finally the result the pulley gear a very interesting moment then is when it's time to remove the part from the print bed actually it's the most dangerous part of the work because you have to be careful to not hurt yourself the clock consists of 30 printed parts, 7 axes, 11 screws also the main escapement parts are printed even the spring is a printed part here is how I put together all the pieces first the escapement wheel, then the lever the gear for the seconds, the yellow spring then there is the balance wheel then there is gears for minutes and hours here is the pulley with five screws to attach the gear finally need to fit in six axes at the same time which is pretty tricky to fit the top frame on it because all six axes need to fit at the same moment the frames to hold together with two screws and it needs an additional four screws for the clock face and it's almost done finally need to put together some pieces for the weight the crank using the crank now to lift the weight the weight is not yet attached but I'm going to attach it now and it's running now we can see the clock running at actual speed I'm using the printed crank to lift the weight finally the weight adds the energy to keep the clock running when it's slowly moving down the clock runs pretty accurate within an hour I couldn't measure a second of difference and with the weight of approximately a 70 centimeters height above ground it runs approximately two hours until it's touching the floor As initially mentioned, it was pretty tricky to fit the parts together and design it properly, so it took me approximately 100 experiments to create, finally, a box of garbage. So this was my short clock story. Time is over and thanks for watching. So you see, this, uh, this story of another maker is kind of very similar to mine. Um, you know, a, a, just a fascination with, with how something works and a mindless pursuit at trying to get it to work. Um, this is sort of uh, something that I think is really useful, uh, just to re remember that, you know, that's exactly the kind of things Mark was mentioning, uh, and that the real magic is uh, not just in making, but in collaboration and documentation. So, you know, do makerspaces belong in libraries? Well, certainly the collaboration and documentation does. Um, and the, the documentation of other organizations, such as museums, uh, belongs in a library. So 3D formats uh, are very difficult to access. Uh, if, if you walk into a library and you'd like, I, I, I want to search, you know, a, a museum database of CT scans of or, or you know, LiDAR scans of you know, some artifact from a long time ago, it's very difficult to, to try and find that. And especially, you know, say you're, you're reading about a particular you know, dinosaur or something like that, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to, to pay money than it is to, to go to the library because I, I think there's, there's not so much an ecosystem and training and an understanding of how you get a dinosaur bone uh, STL file from the library. Uh, I don't even know if, if there are any libraries that have this file, and if not, they should get them. 
uh, because I want to 3D print a dinosaur bone. It could be my next project. Um, so the, the other thing is that I, I, I'd really advocate that 3D printing as, as a way of making and as a way of learning <coughs> is that, you know, that this should be pinned to existing uh, you know, uh, infrastructure. So next to a book on you know, mummies, there should be a, a physical 3D printed replica and sort of like a, a merging of a museum, a fab lab, and a, uh, and a library because making is learning and also a lot of people learn in different ways. I mentioned before that I learn best by doing. Uh, I think that you know, if I was walking and there was a lot of books on, on Egyptian mummies, I might not necessarily pick them up. But if there was something interesting like this sitting there in physical form, I think I'd probably stop a little longer and, and might really get involved in it. And so as much as a way to get people in the door, I think that that's how 3D printing should belong in libraries. Um, sure. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I, I mentioned this project with kids, uh, you know, one way to get people in and, and sort of get them thinking about making is, is to, you know, get them to do something they enjoy and then they can work on other projects. Uh, another thing that is worth watching is this one. This is my model of an automatic transmission. Uh, the input is this handle here going to, through the center. The output is the annulus here with a blue mark to make it easier to see it turn. First gear is engaged with the clutch in this position and this brake engaged. As we turn here, we see that we've uh, geared down the system by a ratio of 4.28 to 1. In order to go to second gear, we shift the clutch in the center to this new position. We disengage this brake. We engage this brake down here. And now we can see that we have a higher ratio of 2.5 to 1 from the input to the output. Third gear is this position here. Removing this brake, engaging this brake. And we now have a ratio of 1.67 to 1, the output spinning faster yet. Fourth gear is in this position. Disengage this brake and engage this brake back on this side. And we can now see that we have an even faster output of 1.3 to 1. Fifth gear is with the clutch in this intermediate position and all brakes disengaged. This effectively locks the entire system together. This is known as drive in most cars because the input and output are one to one. Now sixth gear is called overdrive because it's actually faster than one to one. We engage this brake back here and we now have a 0.8 to one ratio where you can see the output going faster than the input. And then finally, if you want to put the vehicle into reverse, we bring the system back to this side, disengage this brake, engage this brake down here, and you can see now that the system is going in the opposite direction, but at a ratio of 3.9 to 1, nearly the same as in first gear. So you can see that this kind of uh, learning, you know, for, for me to learn how an automatic transmission works, I could have read a thousand words and I'm not sure I still understand it. But I think playing with a model like that would be very valuable uh, for, for everyone, but particularly for someone such as myself. Um, there are other example, uh, libraries do a lot of digitizing, you know, scanning photos. I think the world needs to be digital. Uh, you know, we, we need to be scanning garden gnomes as well. We need a cultural record of these atrocities. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, and then we need to, to put them in the 3D printing software, and then we need to 3D print them out for generations uh, in the future when there are no garden gnomes because they've all been smashed. Uh, so you can see that the quality of uh, this kind of scanning isn't a perfect replica, but it's a start. And these technologies are getting a lot cheaper. This, uh, this scanner is, I think, uh, $13.99, so it's the price of, of a computer, really, and it, it can, uh, you know, digitize a cultural record of, of physical objects. Um, 
So why should libraries embrace making? Um, you know, my three points, uh, it's low cost, sort of. Uh, there is a need for knowledge uh, of this kind and it's not currently served at all. I don't know how to go find a model of an SDL of a garden gnome, but I do know how to find academic literature on it. I think that you know, it's probably more useful to get a digital model if you want to understand you know, the culture behind it and then sort of follow that up with, with reading, uh, and especially as an introduction. So there's a real need that doesn't currently exist, and we need to create a, an uh, ecosystem that, that makers can access. And as I mentioned before, making is on the rise, and Mark made the same point. Uh, and also, learning is the first stage of making, uh, and so we need this to happen now. This can't happen later. It can't be the last thing to happen. It needs to happen now so that when I you know, start a, a new project, uh, I can start with, with research and, and start looking at, at what other people have done. Uh, that is my talk. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> <laughs>